Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. New at 5, our first look at the couple accused of carjacking an 88-year-old woman. We're live as they make their first court appearance. Our severe threat is not done yet. We are still monitoring storms in southwest Michigan. We'll look at the timing on when they'll end up here. Okay, Ben, but we begin with breaking news. Contract talks are over and they do not have a deal. Negotiations aiming to restart critical MDOT road projects have come to an abrupt stop. And Governor Snyder had hoped this new round of negotiations would get workers yeah. back on the job. Uh, but they ended today with union operators leaving the bargaining table saying that officials had reneged on what they thought was a handshake deal. Our business editor Rod Maloney following the story. Rod, you've been talking uh, with the staffers in the governor's office, and I guess they are fuming over this. Well, everybody's assuming, Devin, this is turning into a Pier 6 brawl, but here's the bottom line. The governor himself, the governor's office, are fuming over this. They're furious, and in fact, the governor is threatening to put National Guardsmen, heavy equipment operators, behind the wheel of equipment like this to get the road work started. That's how upset he is, but everybody is upset in this. Check this out. From China, Governor Rick Snyder directed his staff to get mediation going with MIDA and the operating engineers. So on Monday, they started talking, and by the afternoon, the engineers thought, they say, they had a deal. But as the week ground on and the heavy equipment sat silent and wet from heavy rains today, and the engineers' lawyers met repeatedly with the governor's staff, things finally broke down this afternoon. Operating Engineers President Ken Dombrow put out this statement, quote, we are deeply disappointed that MIDA is now torpedoing our agreement with the Governor Rick Snyder administration that would have brought workers and contractors together. The only fair way to resolve this dispute is for OE 324 leaders to meet with the governor immediately so that we can get back to work fixing the roads, end quote. The governor's not going to be home from China until this weekend, and he'd previously said no to a meeting with the engineers. In the meantime, the Michigan Infrastructure and Transportation Association, MIDA, which is the negotiating group for many of the highway construction contractors, contradicted the engineer's assessment. Executive Vice President Mike Nystrom said, quote, there was no deal torpedoed. He said his group hadn't heard from the governor's office since Monday. He said, we want to get back to work. He also angrily decried the engineer's spin, quote, Operating Engineers 324 put out a release that is filled with flat-out lies to the public and its membership, end quote. Now, there, that went on for a couple of pages, and that is on clickondetroit.com if you want to look at it. It has a lot of inflammatory language in it, as all of the language that's come out in this has been inflammatory. And, in fact, Mike Nystrom from, from MIDA said to me today, that uh, the contractors are now ready to end around the operating engineers entirely and bring in subcontractors from out of state if it means getting the equipment back up and running back again. Back to you. Well, what are the other options here to get this all moving forward, uh, Rod? This is uh, obviously the opportunity costs here are incalculable, what this costing this delay. Oh, yeah, you, you can't even count that, Devin. But I'll, I'll read to you from Ari Adler's statement. It's a little lengthy, but you're going to want to hear this. Ari Adler, the governor's spokesperson, said, I can unequivocally state that the operating engineer's 324's claims in its news release are entirely and patently untrue. Our team is working on a simple resolution to extend until December a contract that expired in June. Neither side accepted our numerous offers. That's where the, the struggles came in. And the governor's office is saying this is unacceptable. The work stoppage will put motorist safety at risk this winter. So the governor's options range from withholding payments for contracts contractors to activating the National Guard and using their heavy equipment operators for the road work. So everybody wants to get something done. Now it's a question of how. Great question, in fact. Unfortunately, a very complicated one as well. All right, Rod Maloney will keep following it for us. What a mess. A mess indeed, yeah. All right, now to four live radar. Also a mess. It's been active all day with rain and storms moving through, and we aren't out of the woods just yet. A lot of rain in uh, some spots. Now, no watches or warnings issued, but we are under the threat of severe weather. So Ben is busy right now, Ben. Yeah, it's one of those edge cases where we've got to watch it really closely, but it looks like most of us are probably not going to be dealing with thunderstorms, but the places that are, uh, they could be on the strong side. Nothing going on here currently in our uh, southeast Michigan area. They just popped a warning out for that storm that's uh, exiting South Bend and starting to move to the east. You can tell by the colors here, this is still a soaking wet atmosphere, so these are going to be big rainmakers as they move to the east, and they're not moving very fast either at about 20 miles an hour. Could be a little bit of hail in these storms, but that's really the lower threat. 
By the time it gets here, there's enough change in direction with height that some of these storms could start rotating. That's probably what prompted that warning out towards South Bend. But these are almost moving due east, even though they're making a little bit of development on the north side. So at that rate, we're looking at those to move into Lenawee County by 630 to 7 o'clock. Onstead, if it's still holding together, you'll be seeing that at about 7 p.m. tonight. Tomorrow, we still have a severe threat. Cold front comes through. We'll talk about this and the much cooler temperatures for the weekend. All ahead, guys. All right, Ben. Developing right now, we're getting our first look at the couple charged with carjacking an 88-year-old woman in a Livonia parking lot. Jason Molinas and Jessica St. Clair appeared in court via video a short time ago. Coco McAvoy was in the courtroom, and uh, Coco prosecutors say they did more than just take that poor woman's car. Yes, good afternoon. Police say they not only stole her car, they stole her purse, and they also stole her money. And you were able to see from yesterday that she was very bruised up from this incident as well, making for a very traumatic incident for Gloria Kevelin. We've been brought to court today on a multiple count felony complaint. You have the right to remain silent. The couple accused of carjacking an 88-year-old woman appeared in court today. Count one, carjacking. This alleges that you did in the course of committing a larceny of a Ford Escape being a motor vehicle. Jason Molinas and Jessica St. Clair are facing felony charges after allegedly taking Gloria Kevlin's car and purse, roughing her up along the way. At least they got them and I'm glad of that, you know. Police say Molinas grabbed Kevlin from behind and knocked her to the ground, taking her purse and keys before driving away with St. Clair. But he was very strong, you know, because I'm a big gal and he just had no trouble pushing me right down. Kevlin is one tough lady. Kill the son of a I know you can't put that on there, but I would. She did try fighting back, though. I tried to turn around and sack him with my cane because I always said if anybody bothered me, I'd use my cane. Though that didn't pan out, the two alleged criminals did end up in jail. Both with two million dollar bonds. And the two of them will both be back in court next week for a probable cause hearing. Back to you. Uh, Coco, a lot of people talking about this story for sure on Facebook and on our website as well. A lot of people wondering too why they weren't charged with assault. Is there any explanation for that? Yes, so I did ask the prosecutor's office about that, and she says the reason why they weren't charged with assault is because the armed armed robbery charge itself includes assault within that. Oh, okay. All right, Coco. Glad she's okay, though. Well, uh, police in Gross Point Woods releasing brand new information tonight after a 13 year old fended off an attempted abduction. Happened around 8 o'clock last night on Roslyn near Martyr. The child was able to get to safety and talk to police. Sean Lay following the story for us. And uh, Sean, I guess police have interviewed him, interviewed him now twice, right? Interviewed him twice so far and just got off the phone with Gross Point Woods Police, Devin. They tell me they continue at this hour to get new information from this 13 year old as it pertains to a very detailed uh, uh, description of the guy they're looking for. Police say the bottom line, they want to find this driver that was involved in this. They want to find out from him, his words, what he was doing out there last night. The report of an attempted abduction in Gross Point Woods is causing concerns and raising questions with concerned parents. But yeah, what happened? Get the whole story and then go from there. 750 last night, a 13 year old says he noticed a man driving a black Cadillac Escalade slowly following him near Roslyn and Martyr just off of Vernier. Police initially said the boy darted in front of that driver on his bike. But while interviewing that boy a second time today, the teen says the driver simply jumped out in the middle of the intersection, lunged at him, brushed up against his arm in an attempt to grab him and then chased him for a short time. That 13 year old made it home, told his parents and they called police. Parents say that driver could have been angry at the teen in a road rage type incident, but the fact that the driver got out of his SUV and went after the teen is alarming. I mean, yeah, some, oh, I saw this, and then I saw that, right. and then all of a sudden, yeah, right. police are looking for you, and nobody wants that. Police indeed still looking for this Escalade driver. Detailed uh, description from the teen here, a white male, late 30s, heavy set, brown hair, had an orange ball cap on with a black letter on that cap. He was wearing blue jeans, blue t-shirt, and black shoes. The latest information from police, he's also 
clean shaven Devin. So a lot to go on here, but still a lot of questions to be answered as well. Well, and I know it's been a hot topic around the neighborhood there all day. Does that yeah. uh, help uh, police get any leads on this yet, Sean? Yeah, they have been very vocal about this. So as the school district uh, letting parents know that there has been this incident, they have gotten tips from people that police are tracking down right now. And they're also asking if you got a home security uh, camera system, check it out. Maybe you saw something there or if you did see something, please give police a call. Help them piece this one together. Exactly right. All right, Sean. Meanwhile, a woman is in critical condition tonight after being hit by a train in South Lyon. Happened around 1 this afternoon in the area of 10 Mile Road and Reynold. Police say they found the woman unconscious but breathing at the scene. Preliminary indications are that the woman was trying to cross the tracks when she was struck. 10 Mile Road was shut down for several hours but has since reopened and investigation continues. A woman is in stable condition and after being shot nine times on Detroit's east side it happened in the area of I-94 and Connor around 430 in the morning. Police say they responded to a shooting and found the victim face up on the ground. She had been shot five times in the right thigh, twice in the rear and once in the hip. Police believe the suspects are two men driving an older model SUV. Nine times. Uh, much more ahead on what has been a very busy Thursday. Here's Kevin. His name is Johnny Curry, one of the biggest drug dealers in Detroit in the 1980s. Tonight, he shares his story, including how he came up with the nickname White Boy Rick. All right, Kevin, also a woman walks into a Rite Aid distribution center and opens fire. We've got the latest on a tragedy that has been unfolding today in Maryland. Blaine? Today, the woman accusing Judge Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault says she is willing to talk next week, just not on Monday. So what does this mean for the confirmation process? I'm Blaine Alexander with that story coming up from Washington.